my biggest source of inspiration, I would say, is nature and uh, also photography, um, just as a way to maybe approach nature. Because I, when I do photography, it's yeah mostly uh, landscape and nature, and I, yeah, I could never get enough of that. Going going out uh, in the wild and hiking and do wild camping and uh, trekking, mountaineering, any kind of any anything you could do in nature, I I want to do it. <laughs> I'm delighted to welcome Gail Seguin to this episode of the Learn Squared podcast. Gail is a senior concept artist who creates captivating and exceptional concept art and is now part of the LearnSquared family teaching environment design, which is available now. Having begun her career as a map painter on the Guardians of the Galaxy, she has gone on to work for the biggest clients in the industry, working on films and games alike. And hearing how she has navigated her career so far will surely inspire you as much as it inspired me. In this episode, we gain insight into how Gail became the artist she is today why Jurassic Park is the best, and all that went into a brilliant Lens Squared course, and how it caters to artists of all levels. Buckle up, don't forget to subscribe, and let's go. All right, let's go. Um, everyone, welcome back to the podcast, and we have an awesome guest today, uh, Gail Seguin. Apologies Hi. if I've just um, ruined the pronunciation of your name. Um, no, w- it's welcome. perfect. Cool, cool, cool. Um, firstly, um, excited to have you on for a few different reasons. Um, one of them is just I'm a fan of your work. I think your art is amazing, and. I guess that's quite a cheap thing to say in the, I guess, art community because we say that a lot, but legit, your work is amazing. Um, another reason is because um, you're a Learn Square instructor now. And at the time of recording, although this will be out when your course is out, um, you have a course coming out with us, which is environment design. Again, super, super amazing course. And I'm excited to get uh, in deep with that topic um, with you as we talk but firstly for anyone who may not be familiar with yourself um, if you'd like to give everybody your I guess a short origin story and who you are. Uh, hi Beth thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be part of the Learn Squared uh, adventure and um, so to introduce myself so my name is Gaël Seguillon I'm a concept artist I started my career as a mad painter and then I switched to concept art I'm not working as a freelance for various um, game and uh, uh, movies companies. Uh, I've worked for Lucasfilm, for Quantic Dream, for example. Um, And I don't know how to end it. (laughs) That's cool. That's cool. Um, So when did like... So you basically have... Am I correct in assuming that you've only ever worked in the moving game industry? Sorry? Have you only ever worked in the movie and games industry? Uh, almost. I also worked on documentaries and on um, publishing mm. for na- nas- National Geographic. I did some illustrations, but mostly, yeah, mostly movies and uh, some games recently. Ah, cool. And is that something that you had intended or is that something you kind of fell into? Uh, yeah, I kind of intended it. I always liked um, to try new things. So I'm always interested in yet yeah, uh, trying uh, new fields and a uh, new type of project. And it's been a while that I wanted to work on games. So mm-hmm. when the opportunity came up, I, I was, yeah, I, I didn't hesitate. And um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, on your portfolio so far, at least on your art station, um, the game that we can see that's already up there is Star Wars Eclipse, which I think is yet to be released. Um, yeah. Are there, I, I'm sure you can't announce what are the things you're working on, but like, I guess, how many games have you worked on so far? Uh, so I'm working on another game right now, but uh, there is, I cannot say anything sure, about it. Sure. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be the second game. Cool. And um, why did you want to like kind of work in games like what was it about games that made you want to jump into there obviously you mentioned earlier that um it's something that you you like trying new things was it simply just trying something new or is there something about 
I guess, the gaming space that you definitely wanted to tr um, test your skills at? I would say both, um, because I've always been amazed by uh, uh, games, art books, and all the work that mm. is produced for games. And also because I wanted to try uh, this different approach of um, this different way of uh, seeing concept art compared to movies, because in movies, um, it's very much about the composition because the frame, I mean, the shot is seen for a very, very short time on the mm. screen. So you have to be uh, very efficient in the concept, in the composition. But games, it's more about, about level design and how to approach a whole environment. So it's very different at the end, even though the job is more or less the same. Mm. That's what I found interesting. Actually, that's quite logical and that makes sense because... <clears throat> Like you said, in films, it's like a couple of seconds even, or even half a second where you see something, whereas a game is something that you see for hours on end at certain times and interact yeah, with and, it as well. Yeah, and you interact with it and, and you're walking, you see it from every angle uh, compared to a movie where like the angle is fixed and you don't see anything else. So it's very, uh, yeah, it's a much different way of seeing things. And how did you find that? Is that something that you anticipated or did it come like kind of, not as a shock so much, but almost, did you have to like realign how you tackle, I guess, the tasks that were given to you to work on a game or did it come naturally to you? Um, I did have to readjust, yeah, a bit um, because I, I was not used to think about, yeah, really the uh, game design and yeah, like, if I add something uh, in the in the shot, it's going to it's something we will probably interact with and stuff like that. So it's something yeah, I really had to adjust with at the beginning. But um, I think you at the end the job is the same. You know, you still mm -hmm. think about composition, about uh, uh, the, the base principles are the same. So I, I guess you adapt pretty quickly at the end. And just like, again, looking at your work, um, even in what you have already published so far, um, you can see there's like a lot of different, obviously on the face of it, it's, it's striking and it's brilliant. But when you look a bit deeper, like in the certain projects, some of the personal stuff, some of the client stuff as well, you can see like the different, I guess, like the tasks that you had to do. Like, um, and you mentioned this in the course as well, where you talk about, I guess, different disciplines, obviously your background, as well as concept art has been map painting as well so you can like there's different kind of i guess mindsets or problems you have to solve um but just to, like looking at your work for example you've got things that um clearly more to do with like helping a shot to be established some that's more like figuring out i guess a key moment like a keyframe perhaps um and then other is just purely i guess exploring the environment and even storytelling as well so Okay, it makes sense that obviously when you get into games, um, that will change a little bit as well. But um, it's quite clear that even with when you look a bit deeper, like the way you have set out your work and some of the stuff you've done, you clearly know what the job needs and how to tackle that. Um, and I guess like for a lot of artists, maybe who are starting out or even maybe established as well switching gears a little bit can sometimes be a bit um i guess destabilizing can uh, not off-putting but maybe something that kind of like just throws you off a little bit um is that something that you've worked on intentionally or is that something that again i guess kind of comes naturally to you um or is it something completely different and more so the way you kind of i guess understand the brief and just knowing what the requirements are i don't what is different um, I, don't like, understand. I guess like when you um, have to work on like, say for example, games versus film um, or the different type of tasks that are required. So maybe it's a case of, okay, this is an environment shot. We need it to be figured out purely because it needs to be interacted with or something that just needs to look great um, or something that's going to be a key part of the story. Um, so like, I guess what I'm trying to get at is you tackle different subject matters but not just in terms of the theme in terms of like i guess the execution as well um so is that something that you think of like consciously or subconsciously i'm sorry i still don't understand the question <laughs> no worries no worries um so i guess like working within like i guess different styles then um do you feel like you work in different styles um i wouldn't say so i think um I would I think my style is pretty consistent between project and I think it's also uh 
why I'm hired on some projects, mm -hmm. for example, because uh, I have a very uh, uh, photographic style, if I can say, uh, quite photo real and um, and it's a style that yeah fits some project, but not all project. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I've, I've been asked uh, recently to work on a very stylized project, and I didn't feel comfortable yet to um, to, to try it. It's a bit too much out of my comfort comfort zone, and it's um, it's probably not what I prefer doing. I like uh, I, re I really enjoy actually uh, doing photo real uh, mm -hmm. pictures. Um, so that's why uh, I specialized, kind of specialize myself in uh, that style. Interesting. And I guess it's like, I guess that, that job that came up or that task that came up, um, did you find that hard to turn down or was that something that you just said, not, you know, something that I'm not feeling or don't want to do? And um, it was important for you to, I guess, get that across as soon as? Well, uh, actually, I... It's it's a good question because in a way I'm interested in I'm interested in trying you know it seems uh, quite exciting to start uh, working on a new, completely new style and uh, pushes you out of your comfort zone but um, I don't know if I would like it on the long term. Mm. And how do you find like because you do a lot of personal stuff as well? Um, how do you find the difference between professional and personal? Because again, the looks are consistent um although i guess you can see there's you definitely tackle different subject matter in your personal stuff obviously versus what the client requires um but do, do you have like a different mindset when you approach both um or are they also similar as well no they are very similar for me actually um if probably if my style looks as it is it's also due to the way i work because i uh do a lot of photo bashing i work a lot from photos so uh, that's probably why my style is so photographic. Uh, and I, yeah, I approach uh, personal work and professional work exactly, exactly the same way. The only difference is the topic matter, mm. uh, what I choose to draw uh, uh, for personal work. Cool. And I guess the terms of like, obviously you mentioned a little bit there about because you use a lot of photos, hence why there's that photographic kind of like style that you have. Um, when did you realize that was something that you definitely wanted to double down on? Did it again happen gradually or was that something that you realized that this is the pipeline I want to follow and then you just kind of went at it? That that probably actually came from my matte painting background because mm. as I said, I was matte painter before being concept artist. So I was used to work uh, really with photos to, yeah, photo bashing was my entire job. So um that's why I still have those. Um, uh, I still use photos even when I do concept art. Now it was. I actually had to adapt when I started concept art because I was trying too much to do photo real paintings and to go too much into details because I was my painter before. I was used to that, so it took me yeah some time to adapt to concept art, to let loose a bit and mm. do more painterly stuff. That's interesting. Um, I have like, I guess, a similar experience in that regard. Um, when I was at university and just studying, um, I took the industrial design route. So I guess like the way yeah. um, I was taught how to sketch and draw and ideate, when I started switching to concept art, I was trying to do it in that particular way. And I can relate because, you know, there was maybe not like, there was friction in terms of like, okay, it's not coming across. It doesn't look, like concept art quote unquote yeah, yeah um so then there's adaptation needed then you realize oh there's a different approach and there's a reason why it's this certain way um but then at the same time why did you not stick with something that i guess you already knew how to do it and i guess more comfort with it um what made you want to switch to concept art and also adapt to a new skill set um for several reasons reason actually uh the main one is because um my painting was becoming a very technical, um, a lot of uh, 3D layout, very 3D heavy. And I always pref preferred the more artistic side of my painting. And when I tried concept art for the first time at MPC, I, 
I really enjoyed that actually being free of the technique and just expressing myself uh, artistically and that's why from the first time from the first time I uh, tried concept art I knew I was I wanted to it's what I wanted to do it took me several years to do the switch uh, to build up a portfolio and have my first job offer but uh, I always knew it was what I really wanted to do concept art mm, that's cool and it's interesting that you also mentioned that. So just to confirm, um, your main introduction to concept art, I guess your first taste of it, was on a job, right? Whilst working yeah, for a Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, when I was at MPC on Guardians of the Galaxy. I was my painter there. And um, the the art department needed needed help. They were very busy and they needed some help from the matte painting department to do some concept. So uh, we were a few... Uh, in the matte painting team uh, to do s some concept art for the project and it was to design some buildings for the end of the movie for the city and yeah that's how it happened really because the uh, art department needed help and from that point every time i was going in the company i was asking uh, if i could do some concept art time to time and uh, in almost every company i went yet yeah, it didn't happen very often, but sometimes they would ask me to do little tasks here and there. And I enjoyed it because it also gave me uh, experience mm. for when I wanted to apply for real as a concept, when I felt ready to apply as a concept artist, I had that experience. So that was very helpful. That's that's super interesting and also and quite enlightening to hear as well. Um, and also, I think, inspirational again for... Um, a lot of the listeners who are just figuring out, I guess, um, where their career is going because a few things. Um, firstly, the fact that you're working and then you are also being, you know, like, I guess, like how it works on a job that because, again, workload, they had a lot on their plate, they needed help. You were available or they, I guess, asked you for help. Can you help? And then it's interesting because that, I guess, triggered your journey to concept art. Um, when initially, perhaps, you know, like, I guess the job title, and, um, if correct me if I'm wrong, was uh, initially just a matte painter, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, and it, it just happened and I sit, uh, sized the opportunity and and then after I kind of created the opportunity mm. by asking to do uh, concept art. Yeah, that's, a, again, another thing, um, like, about creating opportunities because... Um, you know, like uh, it's natural for people to perhaps be like, say, timid on certain projects or yeah. especially if they're new to be like, I'm just going to do what I'm told because that's what, you know, I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but then at the same time, it just shows there is no harm in, I guess, like you weren't saying like, give me the work to do, just offering your services. And, you know, I guess like um, if, if you, if you, if they need help, you're there, you're available. Um, and did they take up the offer much? Did they say like, yes, hey, we've got loads of work. Can you just do that as well? Sorry? Um, so when you were like asking for concept art work, um, well, I guess whilst doing your main tasks, um, were they giving that to you as well? The concept art stuff? Like the studios uh, well, where you were working? Uh, yeah, they were some time, you know. Um, they didn't have all the, they didn't have, because I was uh, still my painter, uh, they didn't have a uh, work for me to do uh, all the time but sometime uh, actually when people shouldn't hesitate to ask uh, things like that because first worst case uh, if it's not pos possible they are just going to say no and that's it but I found out that uh, most of the time uh, the supervisor and the uh, uh, the leads were always very happy to know that I was interested in concept art because usually people don't ask and they don't know that you are interested in in, in that, and they really appreciated that um, uh, that I asked actually. Mm. And did you did it ever become too much, like in terms of workload? Because obviously you had like main tasks to do as well. Did it ever get to a point where? You it was like, okay, there's a lot going on here. Um, no. It's hard to manage or was it always enough on your plate? No, never because when I was assigned a concept art task, uh, they would uh, move me away from any matte painting task. Ah. So it never competed because it's in the same company, you know, they uh, adapt the planning so that, yeah, like 
this week I'm going to do concept art and not not painting. Yeah. And um, I guess that was like working all in house, right? Like working in studio. Yeah, 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 yeah. And now you're freelance. Is that correct? Yeah. Cool. Um, I guess how long have you been freelance versus how long were you in studio? So I started being freelance two years ago. Um, I made the switch because um, I just wanted to um, be more free uh, to have more uh, control over the project I choose and the project projects I work on and also to have a bit more freedom about uh, the uh, when I work and when I want to take time off. Uh, so yeah, that what triggered really uh, the change. Ah, and was that something that I guess like did you always have that in um, the back of your mind, or like I guess part of like your career path that I want to be freelance? Or is that something you just discovered whilst working in the studio that okay, these are the things that are important to me now? No, it arrived quite late actually. Um, I knew I knew it was a possibility, but I never. Uh, uh, I was never thinking about it until uh, recently. I don't know why I started to uh, want to try, but uh, it just happened. Maybe seeing uh, other uh, freelance concept artists around and mm. uh, like I was seeing them, yeah, working on some cool projects. So I thought, oh, maybe I should go freelance as well to pick some project as well. You know? And since you've switched to freelance, any regrets or has it always been positive so far? No, it has been very positive um, because, yeah, I've had uh, everything I wanted, which is uh, choosing my project and uh, uh, have more control over my uh, uh, time management. Uh, the only thing I miss is having colleagues, seeing people every day and, um, yes, working with people and exchanging that's something that i miss actually but i know you can be freelance and working in an office so uh, it's yeah two different things because right now i'm working from home but i could i could be freelance in a company mm. um now that's i think a great point to make as well um something similar for myself i've been i think approaching two years or so um freelancing although i've never worked creatively in the studio I have had jobs where I've worked within teams and like yourself, the flexibility, the fact that I can control my schedule and all those things are like priceless for me. Um, but working within teams and working with with colleagues is also priceless. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a shame there's always like, I guess, a trade-off. Um, but, but like you said, like there's are opportunities where you can always work potentially in a studio as well. Um, and what was the jump like switching from studio life to freelance life like did you prepare for it or did you just jump feet first and kind of i guess tackle the problems as they came along or did you do a lot of planning before you made the transition uh no it, um you mean uh for all the administration or for the i guess i guess yeah but uh, all of it um because oh yeah like you mentioned like all the admin stuff um figuring out you know how his taxes going to work out contracts the rates all that kind of stuff versus also um the unknown of like what is it like to work for yourself like you know um what's it going to be like managing your own schedule and yeah i guess everything um so what were the things that kind of like did you prepare for did you not prepare for and things you've learned along the way no i didn't prepare for anything actually mm -hmm. it, it just happened to me mostly because of covid because uh I chose to be freelance at the same time COVID arrived. And so I was kind of forced to work from home and um, yeah, I didn't really have <laughs> um, uh, any preparation. But The reason why I ask is because it's quite like a, a common topic, especially with, again, I always refer to people starting off um, because I guess that's where we're most I get unsecure, insecure unknown there's a lot of unknowns in this space and maybe there's a lot of like worry where there maybe doesn't need to be purely because no one knows what's what's coming next or what should be next um but what was one of the first things that kind of struck you being freelance that you needed to tackle maybe very quickly so um that could be related to 
maybe a project, time management, or even administration stuff? Yeah, for me, it was really the, all the administration stuff because I, um, I moved back to France when I uh, started being freelance. So I had to, uh, yeah, everything was completely new for me. Um, I had to ask around to many people what I was supposed to do. I did a lot of research on the internet and I ended up um, getting uh, an accountant to help me with that. Um, but the, um, the work itself, it's, it's really like um, an office job. The work is really the same. I do the same how, hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I have meetings every day or every two days or... It's really the same. The only yeah difference is that you are uh, you are from home and mm. you are alone, but uh, the work is strictly the same for me. Ah, interesting. So, do you find that you are still working the same hours, or is it maybe a little bit longer now, or even shorter, because you are in complete control of your timing? I guess depends. Uh, depends on the project. At the beginning. I was working longer hours because I was putting myself uh, more pressure because uh, when you when you work um, uh, with a client that you don't see, you want to uh, prove that you are doing the job, you know, so I was uh, tending to work too much, but now I found the balance. I think it's very important to find the balance because between work and personal life, that's why I... I set up hours. Uh, I start at around nine nine thirty, and I end up at around six thirty or seven. That, that's like, cool. Um, I think that's super important as well. I like to set a structure. Um, I say that personally because I'm the complete opposite in many cases. Like even if I set a structure, I always tend to ignore it sometimes, or just for various different different reasons. Um, but the more and more. I made my journey into this space. It is like that is becoming super, super important now. That structure and doing things yeah. at that time. Um, are you quite like? Are you able to work in that structure, or um, is that something that's quite natural for you? Because, um, like I said, like for myself, that's something that can be. At least I find for myself sometimes can be a bit of a hindrance because. I like to have that, at least in my brain, how my brain works. It's, it's a bit strange. My brain is um, <laughs> but like having a bit of flexibility or leeway thinking I can stretch it this much or I can drink it this much. Um, but I know many people who are complete opposite and thinking, this is my time, I have to do it. And then after that, it's completely to be switched off. Um, so what's it like for you? Like, you know, is that something that comes natural to you or do you have to really force yourself to stick to a structure? No, it really comes really uh, naturally for me because I've always been used to, I've always worked in a company before. Uh, in studio, so uh, I just got used to it, and uh, I never had any issue uh, having yeah set hours. And when the hour is done, like mm -hmm. not thinking about work at all. You know, I'm not in weekends. It's it's a weekend. You know, I don't think about work, and I never yeah, it's never been an issue for me. And luckily. for obviously, one thing you just mentioned there about having a structure and I guess working set hours. What are the kind of like, I guess, maybe tips would you advise for people who are freelancing? I guess even just working in the space in general, but more specifically freelancing, what other things would you highly recommend that people should at least think about or even do? To work on set hours? Um, this is just freelance in general. So like, like being in the freelance life, um, obviously one of them is, you mentioned about time, um, structuring time and working to those set hours, but are there other little things that may be health stuff or even like, I guess, equipment, like, you know, desk space and certain things like that. Like, are there any things that jump out to you that, you know, like these are super important for me and I can not be without these specific yeah. things? Yeah, for me, I would say, uh, yeah, the f most important thing that I learned to the last two years is to really separate, uh, the work and the personal time, uh, especially since, because I work from home. So, uh, like the kit, like the living room is just <laughs> one room away. So, yeah, so, um, and also I found that, uh, I had to, um, push myself more to exercise more than I used to because uh, when you work from home, you don't naturally uh, do any exercise because before I was commuting. So I was, especially in London, I was working at least one hour, one hour and a half every day just 
to commute, to go for lunch and everything. And I really felt the change uh, when I started working uh, from home, uh, physically, I mean, because I was yeah, sitting at home and on my desk all the time. So I have to kind of push and force myself to go out and walk, see the sun a bit, you know. <laughs> Now that's that's super important, and it's yeah. it's easy to neglect it. And I say this like I've 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 been there, and I've also done like the opposite. About like, okay, I'm working out, I'm super strict with it. Then I've also fallen off the wagon and gone back to the old habits, and then so it's always that weird cycle. But it's it's invaluable, like, like you just explained, like adding that health element to it and that exercise element to it is almost as important as anything else. Yeah, um, yeah. No, please, please. Yeah, and also, yeah, for the workspace, um, yeah, I realized that how important having a good workspace is because uh, when you think about it, if you work like eight hours a day, you spend, I would say, yeah, at least a quarter of your life of, of your life on your desk. So it's very important to have a good chair, a good desk, and a, a, a good screen, you know, for the eyes. And um, I know it can be very expensive. Uh, to have uh, proper gear, but I think it's. I think you shouldn't as hesitate to uh, put the money into it mm -hmm. because you spend yeah uh, a lot of your life on it at the end. Um, that's actually an interesting topic about, I guess, uh, investing in your equipment and even just your workspace, um, because. I guess when it does come to like things like finance and even just like thinking, what do I need? A lot of the perhaps. I guess the, the at the top of the list is you know PC and software and all those kind of things. Um, and then what's at the bottom of the list is things like desk and chair and etc. But um, it's equally important, of course, uh, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah. And like, is that something that you learned perhaps the hard way, or were you very aware that okay, I need this? You know, like this is super important. Yeah, no, it didn't occur to me at the at the beginning. I had yeah, like uh, shitty uh, <laughs> desk and shitty. Sh chair you know from ikea but uh, yeah i learned after yeah having back pain and uh i ha at, when i started i had a super small 21 inch screen so i bought a bigger one uh, to be more comfortable but yeah it's very important at the end <laughs> um again i can relate like if i look back at some of my setups in the past and how i was working um my body actually already feels pain just looking at those sets <laughs> I had before. Like some of the stuff I was thinking, what was I thinking? It's like some, um, yeah, no, I don't want to think about it because it's bringing back some very painful memories. Um, but now it's super important. Like you said, if anyone is on the fence about, do I invest in this shop at the money, not in this and something else, like for someone from speaking for myself, who's got chronic pain and had chronic pain and a lot of it has come from, a posture of i guess doing art even um one bazillion percent put that money in because it will you when the older you get it's just going to get more painful yeah, yeah i'm sure it, you'd agree right yeah yeah totally even having a dedicated room to, to work if is important i find to focus and to yeah, separate your work from personal life as well 100 percent um and i guess like switching gears a little bit and going back to your art journey when did it begin for you? Like, when did you realize that you are an artist? Um, yeah, let's start with that question. When did you realize that you are an artist? So when did I realize that, uh, you mean before starting working yeah, like, in this street? Yeah, like even way before that, like I guess um, growing up and, you know, childhood perhaps. Like when did you realize that, okay, art is super fun. I love it. And yeah. um, I can't, like, you know, I just have to do it. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, the thing is that I am drawing since I can hold the pen, so I don't even remember when I started. Uh, probably, yeah, I don't know, at three years old, I don't know. Uh, but for all my childhood, I never uh, actually considered uh, doing uh, uh, doing art as a job. I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know it, yeah, it was a for me, being an artist was only like painting, you know, mm -hmm. on canvas, you know. Uh, so I never considered, and I, it's not really something I knew I wanted to do. So I never considered uh, this as a job, and I 
until very late. I didn't actually know what I wanted to do uh, uh, as a, of my life. Mm. Uh, I would say it occurred to me um, when I was a teenager. Um, I always loved watching uh, the making of movies uh, like uh, Lord of the Ring and uh, Star Wars. And I was always ama amazed by all the concept art that were produced and all the, um, even the, uh, the, the miniature work and the costume work, uh, the, everything they do on set and all that stuff. And that when I started um, searching online, if there was a school that were teaching you that, and, and that, yeah, that, that's, I guess that's when I, it became a thing and I started, wanted to work in, uh, in the movie industry and to do that kind of work. I didn't know at the time what were exactly the specific jobs I could do, like matte painting, uh, concept art, that kind of stuff. I, I knew a bit about it from the books, but not much. I didn't know, yeah, that there was so many... Uh, different jobs like yeah, lighting artists, modeling and all that. And it's, it's really at school when I learned all that. Now it's interesting that like, in this industry, maybe now it's a little bit different where you can easily Google stuff, but even like, you know, yeah. there's more material about these are the specific jobs. Whereas, you know, like if you want to be a lawyer or let's say in the medical field, already that's broken down into different sectors and different types. Like say if you want to be a doctor, there's like a hundred types of doctors you could be, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but like you just explained, you saw something that amazed you, that wowed you, that definitely got your interest. But even then, there was not something that you could see that, okay, what do specifically I follow? Which is cool to see because you went by your, I guess, what was what your passion was, like something that really spoke to you and you couldn't really, I guess, shake that. It was a case of, it has to be this. Um, so what was that journey like for you? Like, how did you start unpacking this space and realising, okay, this is how I'm going to develop myself, how I'm going to basically enter um, this industry? Um, just by, I guess, by starting Googling, uh, if there were schools, uh, that were teaching this kind of job and I was finding some school and I applied and I got, uh, uh, they accepted me in one of them and that's, yeah, that's how it started. Um, and what was that like? What were they, I guess, teaching? Um, was it specifically stuff that's related to digital art or was it still a bit more, I guess, art-like, but you had to kind of adapt it to the digital art space? So the first school I did was um, uh, it's called Super. It was called Superfocum in south of France, and it was very much specialized in um, uh, animate animation movies. You know, uh, animation uh, like uh, uh, Pixar, that kind of uh, right, 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 that kind of stuff. And so it was three D, but very much uh, stylized. Uh, and it's uh, when doing that school that I realized that uh, I really enjoyed 3D and Photoshop and all that, but uh, not so much working on, uh, on animated features. Uh, I really preferred uh, feature films, mm. um, more yeah, realistic um, uh, movies. So that when uh, so I started searching for that. When I was at school, I started to know a bit more about the different branches and the different jobs. So uh, I knew a bit more what to search to uh, to have what I want. And that's when I started to search for a VFX school. Uh, and I found ArtFX. Uh, that's where I did the last three years of my studies. And yeah, in that school, I really felt as soon as I arrived that, yeah, it was a school for me and that, that was really what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, even though when I started the school, I didn't know if I wanted to be lighter or matte mm -hmm. painter, or I, but I knew that the VFX was yeah, something that uh, talked to me and um, just yeah, the dream of working on, on movies, you know, it really uh, appealed to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so VFX, looking at it now, or at least uh, the definitions of it now, that 
versus concept art, for example, and even matte painting, that's very technical, right? Like it's almost like, you know, um, yeah, like it's the most scientific, the, the most scientific creative thing in this space. Um, so yeah, how, how did you kind of like negotiate from VFX to concept art? Um, what do you mean? How? Um, so yeah, so like when you started um, the VFX school, uh, what yeah. um, were you learning at the time? Like, how did that progress? Sorry, not, not concept art to matte painting because you started off as matte painting, correct? So yeah, as a professional. Yeah. So actually, in that school, uh, they teach you uh, all the VFX workflow, um, all the steps, um, and I specialized myself in matte painting uh, because there was, there was really no concept art courses or uh, uh, yeah they, they they were really not teaching concept art at the time in the school so i was i specialized myself in matte painting because it was what was uh, the closest to what i enjoyed i, I always loved nature and uh, painting landscapes so matte painting was really close to that and that's why i chose matte painting and um, that's why i started uh, my career as a matte painter ah and when you got into the industry, actually, I know I know how you got into the industry because you explain it in the course, which we'll get to very very shortly. Um, and that was from, I guess, the was it a final project that you had, or was it a part of a project for that course? Yeah. Um, so when, so when you do, um, so when you, uh, so when you do that kind of uh, school. Uh, you, the last year you spend it on a personal project that you do with a team of like three to, I don't know, six people. And it's going to be this movie, this short movie is going to be your showreel basically mm -hmm. uh, that you're going to show to professionals at the end. So, um, sorry, what was the question? I forgot. Uh, no, so more like, um, actually, no, I think I forgot on myself. Um, <laughs> no, the, your final uh, project, basically I'm referring to, uh, is it Amazia or Amazia? The, the yeah, film? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazia, yeah, so, yeah. so how did, um, how did that come about? What, sorry? What? The, the project, like how did, how was that experience making that project? Because, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that led to you breaking into the, the industry as a professional, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, in the t in the uh, with our team, uh, the Amazia team, we wanted to uh, focus the project on matte painting because we were two uh, who wanted to specialize in matte painting. So we pushed the project toward uh, environments and landscape and uh, things that could, that could uh, that could be a good um, uh, showreel for matte painting uh, and. And working on this project, we learned a lot on uh, what a uh, matte painting workflow can be in a, in a studio. Uh, it was kind of working on a really tiny movie, you know. Um, the workflow, actually, yeah, when, when I started working after in the industry at, at MPCs, um, I didn't feel much of a difference uh, compared to the what I was doing on my personal, on my... Uh, 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 Amazia project. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I, um, the integration uh, happened very smoothly because it, yeah, I was really doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And but, when you were doing that, like your mindset, were you really pushing yourself to build it at a professional level? Um, or was again that something that come, kind of comes naturally? Because I know like with certain, I guess like having been in university and doing certain projects a lot of it is a case of you know you do the project just because you kind of have to but then you can always add that extra level to it to kind of really you know like push what you want to achieve or like even test out skills um so was that the case for you like is that something that you really put a lot of energy into it um or yeah. did that just all come like kind of naturally and it kind of clicked yeah yeah we we did with the team we all did our best to do uh yeah the best possible um uh, short movie and um it's really a challenge and um uh, i forgot what i was to say yeah that's cool um but like what was it like to 
get that break then? Because it was, is it NPC that kind of like, so how did that NPC job come about? Were they looking at your reel and approached you? Or did you start yeah. using that to apply to different studios? No, they actually were actually there um, when we had the graduation day where we show all, the, all our movies. Uh, there is people from many companies uh, and NPC was part of the companies and they, yeah, they saw the, the movie and they really liked it and uh, like, I don't know, one or two weeks after they offered me a job there as a mud painter. Nice. That's why it happened, how it happened. And again, you just mentioned that it was like, it was seamless almost, the fact that what you had to do on the project versus professionally. Did that surprise you a little bit? Did you expect it to be more difficult professionally? Or Yeah, I did yeah. I did expect, I was very stressed, especially because uh, of English, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, arrive, you arrive in a new country, they all speak English. And that was actually the hardest for me too, because I was mm -hmm. really bad at English. But the work itself was, it was even easier, I found that, than uh, my graduation movie, maybe because I was pushing myself so much on the graduation movie to, um, to push my limit and to do as much as I can in the short, in the time we had. And, and then from there, it's kind of like blossomed into where your career is at now, right? It hasn't stopped, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also when you, st when you start on a new job, especially at, at, uh, as a junior, they, they know you are, it's your first job, they know you are junior, so they, they're not going to give you the craziest, the hardest task mm -hmm. to do. And I was actually, I felt lucky because at MPC, they, in other company, when you are junior, they really give you junior uh, tasks to do, even though you could do more. While at MPC, they really trusted uh, uh, the juniors and they were always pushing ourselves to uh, do more challenging stuff. And that's what, that's something I really appreciated there. Mm -hmm. That I, something that I didn't find in other companies. Interesting. And of your experiences with the company, how many different companies have you worked for to date? Um, oof. Good. Uh, <laughs> at least 10, I would say. Wow. And I didn't count. It. <laughs> and what was like, is there like an average length of time you were there? Or I'm sure I've thought some varied, some were longer, some were shorter. Um, but I guess what was the shortest time you were at a company? Um, probably six months. Uh, okay. Maybe it was uh, when I was in Australia, in Sydney. At Animal Logic, I worked six months there. And the longest time you've been at a company? Um, longest, probably ILM. Mm -hmm. I how, long, stayed, how long was that? It was two years. Cool. And with those, that, not, we, sorry, please. It's yeah. not very, it's it's not very long, two years. But yeah, I, I, as I said previously, I like to try new things and to, mm. so that's why I jumped a lot between companies just to have new experiences, you know. And for working at studios like these, obviously they all do different things, but I guess they all work on predominantly movies. So they all like tackle, I guess, the same subject matter in terms of like working for film. Um, what is the most common thing that you'd experience in a place like this? So again, for someone who's maybe looking to work in a studio or work in this field, um, just to explain to them like, a taste of like what to expect. So like say for example, Animal Logic within those six months, what is kind of like the day to day like? Like what will you, they'll be asking you to do? Does it vary day to day even? Like is it every day the same? Or are they completely random each day? Um, but yeah, like what, what, give us a flavor of like, what's it like to being that kind of like environment and space? Um, generally, I would say f uh, in every company, it's more, le more or less the same. Uh, you join a department, uh, so for me, it was matte painting department and you are in a team of matte painter. You are assigned on usually one project, sometimes two, but usually one. And you have a lead and you have your, your team with you and they, ass they assign you tasks, uh, matte painting tasks that you have to do. And you have dailies, uh, like every day or every mm -hmm. two days where you show to the supervisor and um, that's it basically. Uh, yeah. Like typical mad painter day i would say <laughs> and i i assume that it's it, i guess it varies project to project as well obviously like some some films take longer than others um yeah so like what's i guess the longest film you've worked on or even like the longest project you've worked on um i don't know maybe it's 
could have been Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. I yeah. think I walked. I'm not sure because it was a long time ago, but I think I walked one year on it. I'm not sure. Wow. Yeah. More or one year and three months. I forgot. And but does that ever like fatigue you working on long projects? Do you get any fatigue mm. with that or not so much? No, this one didn't fa never fatigue me because uh, first it was my first job. So I was excited about everything. And also, um, um, even though you're in the same movie, you there are there are different sequences, so the type of work changes depending right, on which sequence right. you are. So it's never uh, always exactly the same. So keep on topic of movies, for example. Firstly, I'm, I'm super happy to hear that you mentioned the making of Lord of the Rings is an inspiration yeah. to you. For me, it's like, and also. I asked you obviously last week about like what's your favorite film and you answered Jurassic Park. Um, same for me as well. That is like yeah. my number one film. It's the first <laughs> time I watched in the cinemas. So I could, I could argue that it probably that's what changed my life almost. Um, but it literally the best things I've ever seen, even though I talk about Star Wars a lot, um, which I still love, but the best things I've seen are those two things you mentioned. And sometimes I don't know which one's better. The making of Lord of the Rings. I love Lord yeah. of the Rings, but the making of Lord of the Rings is special. And yeah, it's, it's like a movie by itself. Oh my God. And um, just what you mentioned as well, like I must have been, I was, I was a teenager when that came out. Um, and then obviously having the extended edition DVDs, watching them. I didn't know what to expect because... Back in the DVD days, I'm sure a lot of listeners are not familiar with DVDs, um, but back in like the DVD days, a lot of this stuff's probably on YouTube now. A lot of the behind the scenes was very markety. It was also like, hey, we did this for the first time and we did this and it was difficult. Hey, look at this. It was cool. There was nothing that was like a documentary that was yeah, like yeah. in depth and showed you almost every single aspect of the pipeline from, yeah, true. from like you mentioned from the concept art to the making the props it really made you appreciate the work that these guys put in and i'm sure you'd agree that it wasn't fake it was genuine you could clearly see that these people were putting their heart and soul into yeah um, their stuff um so yeah i'm not gonna i'm gonna stop talking about that because i could go on all day um <laughs> but yeah like why for yourself, coming from yourself, why is the, and you kind of, I mentioned it as well because it pretty much kind of like triggered, I guess, your career and your curiosity. But what is it for you that makes that making of so special for you? Like, what is it for you? Well, it's, I would say, like you said, it it's, it's one of the first making of that was showing so much, uh, all the work that was put in the movie and all the steps. And yeah, you could see that um, people were so passionate about uh, what they were doing. And also at the time, it was very technically uh, new and uh, it, yeah, it, like they really opened new doors and just seeing how they did things because yeah, when you see like Gollum, you have no, like, you have no idea how they mm. could do that and even i remember watching the making of even yeah at the time i had no idea how they could do that how it was done but it was kind of fascinating to see uh, them show all all the process and uh, they, they make it look like it was very easy but uh, i know it was <laughs> very very complicated <laughs> Gollum's a great example and um it also like Sometimes when you see something made, almost like, you know, you kind of see, um, I forgot the phrase now, but like when, when you see what, what the actual making of is, um, it kind of like maybe ruins the magic. For me, I'm sure for yourself as well, watching that adds the magic. Like when you see that, yeah. um, like Garland running on rocks, is Andy Serkis running on rocks, but you, even though you know there's a the actual dude there, they did a, such a great job that you see Gollum there. Um, so now it's a, it's a straight up masterpiece. A masterpiece showing the making of a masterpiece. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> um, and Jurassic Park, why is that? Why do you love that film? Um, I don't know. I've always been fascinated, fascinated with that movie since I'm a, a kid. I didn't watch it on the cinema probably because I was too young at the time. Um, my parents didn't let me <laughs> uh, watch it, but I, I've always... Uh, I've been passionate about dinosaurs since I'm a kid. I was reading books and uh, 
uh, I had dinosaur toys and all that. Uh, so that added to the yeah, hype for this movie probably. And it's probably also because it's even, even when you watch it now, it's so well done. It's, it really, it doesn't age and both the cinematography and the uh, visual effects um, are quite fascinating in uh, that movie, I find. It's, uh, again, the same. Like, growing up, even today, um, nerded out of a dinosaur is just a subject matter. Like, in school, just... the. And also, I think the most appealing thing is, is, like, in film, especially fictional stuff, a lot of the creatures we see is all made up, right? It's all make-believe. These things were actually... Ex they actually existed. They were giants in real life. Uh, obviously, long, long time ago, but it just adds... Yeah... Uh, again, I'm not going to go on too much about that because I could talk about it forever. Um, but now, like, Jurassic Park and I think Dinosaurs is, like, it is always a win. Um, but I think, and I, I don't know if you'd agree with me, taking, like, films, and maybe, like, a film in terms of, like, say, a movie-going experience, like, that everyone can enjoy. Because, obviously, there's, like, different levels to films. There's, like, very artistic films, very, you know, like, I guess, philosophical films. Something that's definitely more mature for for grown-ups right and there's a kiddie films that are more for entertainment i personally think jurassic park is perhaps the most perfect film that anybody can watch at any time at any age yeah, it's pretty timeless. yeah what other things inspire you like feed into your inspirations like maybe not even necessarily movies um what are the things that are kind of like obviously you've mentioned lord of the rings making of um i'm sure the film you love the film as well um the jurassic park but what other things are kind of like in your personal treasure box of you know like inspirations and passions just coming back quickly to jurassic park it's oh, yeah, also the um, it's a it's a movie that makes you wish it was uh, true it makes you dream you know that uh, one day we could really see dinosaur for real and uh it's, a, yeah. it's it's really a movie that made me dream when i was a kid <laughs> that's a perfect want, way to put it yes i want you yeah to believe in it and it was yes yeah, so well done for that i find yeah, so even though there's a chance that you could get eaten it was so like i want this to be real like i want yeah. them to find some frogs grow some eggs and then release yeah. some dinosaurs <laughs> but yeah to come back to your uh, last question uh what really inspired me is uh my biggest source of inspiration i would say is nature and uh also photography um just as a way to maybe approach nature because i when I do photography, it's yeah, mostly uh, landscape and nature. And I, I could never get enough of that, going, going out uh, in the wild and hiking and do wild camping and uh, trekking, mountaineering, any kind of, any, anything you could do in nature, I, I want to do it. <laughs> yeah. And um, when did that like start for you? Like, is that something that you've always been, you've been outdoorsy since a young age or is that something that you... <laughs> Um, developed later on because for me I don't do it as much but I do enjoy it now but I started enjoying it more in like my late 20s and 30s when was it for you and um, I was never an outdoorsy girl when I grew up I actually hated you know having to walk and you know, to do hike <laughs> and stuff like that but uh, at the same time I I've always liked adventure and and dis discovering you know new places and whether it's in real life or in games, I always like exploring hidden things, you know, and uh, the the adventure of the uh, of the un unknown, you know. Mm -hmm. And that what I think triggered me when uh, I was an adult to start hiking and to start. I don't know. I just felt the need uh, one day to. Uh, go on a hike. I've never done that, and I wanted to try and. Uh, when uh, when I had the opportunity, I organized my first trip, and mm -hmm. I, re I really, yeah, it's since um, I really enjoyed it, and I never stopped since. And mm -hmm. I always want to do more, and I always push myself to do more crazy things. And I don't know, it's kind of a drug now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to explain it, but I guess it's one of those drugs that are kind of like healthy drugs apart from if yeah. you do you break your leg on a hike hopefully you don't um but you know like i get what you mean like in terms of 
especially as creators like feeding your imagination yeah. nothing can beat it right i i am always amazed about it. even like last weekend i went back uh, to my hometown and even if i knew this place i will i was still amazed by yeah what nature can create because i i flew my drone over like some oh. um dried out beach and the seeing this new perspective really amazed me you know i was seeing things that uh, i've never seen before even though i knew that place um yeah i don't know i'm always amazed by uh, that's, uh, that's what a great nature point. can create you know no for sure like even like just in terms of just i guess like art philosophy in general just looking at the same thing from different perspectives yeah can yield so many different like results and inspirations um but that's cool you got like a drone so what one thing obviously you do as well um is photography um and how long has that journey uh, how long have you been on that journey um I, more or less at the same time when i started uh, doing hikes and going into nature I started uh, taking photos at the beginning purely for gathering references mm -hmm. because I was my painter and I knew it was hard to get good references online, um, good high res, good quality references. So I uh, bought a camera and to shoot my own references. And yeah, and I ended up really enjoying it. Um, it became a passion almost. And I, I've seen like you release packs and stuff like that as well. Um, so I guess like, what's your library like now of like just even reference pictures? How uh, many? Oh yeah, I have a lot. I've covered so many different environments, and I've yes, thousand like ten thousand hundred thousand. I don't know how many photos I have, but I have so much. I have so much that I'm not even um, using yeah a third of them in my projects. You know. <laughs> No, but I think but, it's cool that you do that because for people, like you mentioned, the reason, one of the reasons why you did it was because you weren't getting what you wanted in terms of like, I guess, uh, material for matte paintings initially. Um, so to create a resource, I'm sure on behalf of the arts community, they'll, let, they'll allow me to thank you for that as well. Um, but like, even just on that topic in general, like, do you think it's important that artists and creatives in general should seek out a lot of their own references whenever they can. Yeah, I think it's not mandatory because, yeah, I can understand that some people find it boring to, yeah, get a camera and shoot mm -hmm. stuff. But I think it's uh, very useful, um, not only because it gives you the, the reference material, but also because it trains your eye in a way to see things differently and to... Uh, observe nature more to observe how uh, things are made, how the I don't know the materials work uh, work in real life. You know, I think it trains your eyes a lot. Like how do you think your art would be if you didn't do those things? Like, do you think it'd be drastically different, or do you think it'd just be maybe like what do you think having the experience of going out? obviously gathering references and just even like being in that space and like you mentioned observing like do you think if, if you can i guess it's hard to put like a number on it or even something specific on it but what kind of like edge do you think it adds to your work and if you didn't have that um like do you think you'd be able to see in your work maybe that um if you didn't have those experiences that it'll perhaps show up in your work i cannot say how how different it would be if i didn't uh if i wasn't doing this but uh for sure it helps me uh yeah create i would say more believable world uh, in the sense that um i going going out and seeing uh, stuff with your own eye uh, helps you understand more how light works and how for example if you yeah if the if if the weather is overcast or if if it's daylight or like even um a sunrise whether there is clouds or not in the sky it uh, seen the nature i mean the place is lit totally differently so that's something i'm going to recreate in my paintings knowing that you know mm -hmm. having that experience uh makes you realize things and makes you understand more how uh, nature is made i would say 
And it's obviously quite evident in your work, even like some of the professional stuff as well, but even definitely your personal stuff. Like, I guess all the things that we mentioned, the making of Lord of the Rings, dinosaurs, Jurassic Park, nature, photography, like you definitely, in, in an amazing way, like it's, it's definitely like imprinted into your work. Um, obviously you mentioned before that that's very deliberate as well because that's your personal interest. Um, but, you know, like, it's cool to hear that as well because it kind of like definitely a bit like the making of Lord of the Rings. You get to see like the making of these amazing paintings because your work is awesome. Um, and my first, first time I experienced your work was um, I believe a couple of years ago, you were doing a demo at industry workshops. I think a demo day. Yeah, and, I remember. And it was that um, the dragon shrine piece. Yeah. So I was literally like, you're making it. I was, I don't know, like a few rows back and I just saw this and I saw you, I, I think it was in, um, I'm not sure what software it was at the time. It might have been Blender, but I think it might have been just the Octane bit. But you were just moving around, looking for the scene. I could see like the score and even though it was kind of like not finished yet, you could just already see that, wow, like that is going to be a sick, sick piece. And obviously it is. <laughs> um, so that was my first experience of like your work and thinking like, wow, this, this is legit. Um, and then obviously exploring your work even further and all the different subject matters because you know it's not always necessarily the same theme but the quality is consistent which which is something that like I'm always like trying to strive to even get to that level I'm not really that level yet but um, I know that's like a lot of people want that as well so it's cool to see that you can deliver that consistently um, so then obviously when I discovered that you were making a course for Learn Square like that was like yes of course you know because knowing how you create obviously is great but then seeing how you teach that as well is also for me like another level of like cool things to appreciate um so on march 28th which if this comes out at the time i wanted to come out is yesterday your course <laughs> has now come out environment design um i'll hand it over to you what can we expect from this amazing course in my opinion um so hopefully i'm hoping that this course is going to be uh, equally helpful for um beginners intermediate and more professional uh, artists who want to learn new technique because um um i made um i made my course uh easy to follow for beginners uh because I'm showing some of the basics, but also I'm going more in depth about some, I'm, sh I'm really showing all the techniques I use on a daily basis and uh, all the tips I know. And I really believe that um, some can be really helpful for people to use. Maybe, maybe they know it already, but maybe they don't know all of them. And um, um, I think it's always useful also to, um, know a bit to to watch other people's workflow because there is not only one workflow. Everybody has a different way of approaching a painting, and uh, so I'm I'm showing my way, and maybe it's gonna give ideas to people on how to ap approach their, their painting, uh, especially for for example for sketching. Um, I wanted to show a different way of sketching sketching thumbnail. Than people usually do. Usually, people people just um, uh, start, you know, sketching from scratch. And I wanted to show a different way of um, approaching a thumbnail from uh, using photos when you don't know uh, how to sketch at all uh, uh, to make it easier. You know, to, not to start from a blank page, but to use photos. Um, yeah, I'm really hoping uh, uh, it's going to be helpful for people to know more about my workflow and to see how I do things. From my angle, um, I can already see how it's going to be helpful. What I'm definitely curious of is the different kind of like, I guess, art people are going to create from this workflow. Because yeah. from watching the course, like it does unlock and even demystify a lot of the pipeline, especially for making, I guess, like photorealistic and high fidelity um, environments. 
Um, for example, that specific thing you mentioned about sketching with photos. Like when I saw that, I was like, of course, like why, you know, like this is just so simple but an elegant way and even like it's still sketching it's still like at that freedom of sketching it's yeah. not like you know the precision and back to what i was mentioned before about um like say switching from a discipline to a different discipline like mm -hmm. say industrial design to concept art there's like a bit of rigidity in the industrial side of things versus the some of the looseness in concept art for me that you know it, um that kind of relates to this as well it's like whenever I've used photos, it is specifically either for maybe photo bashing or just something more, maybe perhaps technical. Never ever thought that, let's just sketch with this. Yeah, so paint overs is one thing, but this is not a paint over, this is a sketch. And that was yeah, like yeah. very free. And yeah, like even just that alone, like some of those, watching you do those, I was thinking, you know, this is like better than some of the finished concept arts that are available there. So like, when did that technique become something that you use like is that something that you uh, clearly you're very experimental with different techniques and seeing what works is that where that came from and when did that real uh, when did that click for you thinking yo this is you know i have to do this more often or again was it something that just kind of like happened maybe by accident or it was just like again an organic process i guess i've always been working like that since the very beginning since uh, even school when probably it comes yeah from matte painting mm -hmm. again because yeah, when you're a matte painter, you use a lot of photos. It's a lot of photo bashing. So when I switched to concept art, I pretty much used the same matte painting techniques, but I, apl I applied it to concept art. So it, it stayed and I made it more, um, more like a tool, like, uh, even though uh, in concept art, I am doing more sketchy stuff, more uh, experimental, yes, like, as you said. I still use photos, yeah, as, as a tool. Uh, it really became part of my workflow uh, like that. And I, I also, even like just taking a step back from that as well, because um, um, all of that happens, I think, in the, the first lesson. But prior to all this is like a reference gathering, which I guess is quite an obvious thing. Um, but the way you do it is a little bit different. And also when you see how you do this, the sketching process, it all obviously ties in. It's there to feed that process. And um, the way you lay out the references and gather references, and even like not necessarily, you know, like some of it's just like adding mood, inspiration. Some of it's a case of, you know, like the way I, the way I looked at it was like a chef laying out ingredients, knowing that they're going to use this in a specific way. That's for this, that's for seasoning and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, or to make like, you know, the image. So... Like even like just for then you mentioned it before about beginners is like say someone who has got a pipeline of course you can see okay I'm gonna add this and place it in there but for a complete beginner you can just clearly see if they just follow this step by step this is a legit workflow that is like it's not just about making an environment if you just work that way even in like I tend to do like vehicles and stuff if I just copy that for this that's gonna make my pipeline so much more smoother than what it is already so um that that is cool to see as well um, and it's, yep, and it's yep, also yep. a very flexible workflow that can be used uh, uh not only in vfx and games but also for making illustrations mm -hmm. or uh, for yeah like i'm using the same when when i did uh, an illustration for national geographic it's the exact same workflow that I used. Uh, it can be used, yeah, for pretty much any image you want to do. And I'm also showing how to get away from the photographic look to make to blend things uh, with CG and make it more painterly. And it's a it's a very organic uh, workflow. Yeah, that's again another thing that's quite important to mention as well is that I guess is a, a quite common thing that can happen in especially like paintings perhaps like if there's like say photos use even 3d is you can sort of see the 3dness of it or the you know the the photoness of it and just kind of like blending it in a way where you forget about the process it's about what you're trying to communicate in the image itself and that's yeah. definitely showed in the course itself um another thing what i think is quite cool as well is i guess you could split it there's two key projects that are made one's essentially 2d and one's using a 3D pipeline. Obviously, they all end up as amazing paintings. Um, but like, 
obviously you mentioned you started off with 2D initially in your career and obviously your journey so far. When did 3D start becoming something um, that was quite common in your workflow? Because you mentioned as well, like because of the more 3Dness of certain things that made you want to steer um, away some of the projects you were doing. So, and also the reason why I asked this question, because the way you use 3D, is also very creative and very cool and also very efficient as well. Um, so yeah, when did 3D start becoming um, a part of your pipeline? Uh, it was when, uh, quite early actually, uh, at ILM, I started to use 3D and it was mainly out of necessity because uh, for topics, like for example, when you do architecture or even for me characters, because I'm very bad at drawing characters, so I I need CG to help me have a, a coherent posing and a, a coherent base and architecture also because it's um, so rigid um, and it's not always easy to get it right, you know, with photos and with painting. So CG helps a lot to just to get a base, uh, a coherent and yeah, a base that works. And that's why I started using uh, and learn, uh, I already knew CG, but I started using it in my uh, concept art um, because, it, yeah, it helps you uh, create more uh, uh, more coherent images mm -hmm. in the lighting, in the perspective, and for yeah, in my case, for characters, in the posing, also in the anatomy. And some may argue that because obviously you teach two D and 3D as well, that the, the way the industry is and obviously the use of assets and just speed in general, like perhaps 3D is the only way to go. Um, so in that case, why is there like say a 2D element specifically for that? Like, when would that be more beneficial than th a 3D pipeline? Um, typically speed because photo bashing and doing 2D is much, much faster than 3D. There is, uh, unless you are very technical and very good at CG, uh, it takes time, you know, to set up a scene and uh, to, yeah, texture thing, light it and everything. Uh, so um, in most cases, 2D is always faster, like especially when you do landscapes and like backgrounds, it's so much faster to throw a few photos together to create a landscape than having to do it in, in in CG. So especially when you're a concept artist, you have usually pretty short deadlines. So you have to yeah, be fast. So, so I guess, sorry, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I forgot what. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, again, it's like one cool thing about the course as well is the two pipelines. And I say, keep saying two pipelines purely because of the 2D and 3D. There's a lot more things that happen in the course, but it just shows that this is again for beginners, for advanced, for super pros as well. Wherever your challenge is at that point in time, whether it's, you know, like say, okay, you need to do something quick, you can simply switch to the 2D option and then you deploy that and get your task completed. Then obviously, if you want to have something more detailed or whatever else, you can switch to 3D. Like you mentioned before, it is super flexible. So you can switch it, change it. It's not necessarily you have to follow it linearly. You can adapt it and almost use it in any way you need to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for example, the, um, the painting I did with 3D, I could have done it with 2D as well. Uh, it's just that 3D is more flexible to find um, uh, to find compositions. Uh, in the 3D part of the tutorial, I wanted to um, show how when you have no idea about which composition you are going to make, how to use 3D to help you find composition as, as well and it then, can be used uh, as a tool yet yeah, to help mm -hmm. you find ideas also and you definitely go through it in the course in, in a lot of detail as well in a nice digestible detail where if someone's completely new to 3d um where to get assets from obviously blender is, is the software that you use which is free so it's yeah. super accessible so again even the things that i never thought of using in blender or even just 3d in general i've been using 3d for quite a while thinking yeah, again, a bit like the photo sketching, like, why didn't I think of that? Like, that's so elegant, simple, easy to use, and also adds that 
bit of originality that sometimes using off the shelf assets don't give you because you know like we both can be given the same asset it's the same asset but the way you customize the asset and make it your own um in a brave way because sometimes maybe you could maybe lack of knowledge of 3d it's easy to like think okay that's the asset i'm not going to touch it because i don't know if it breaks i'm not how to fix it again so you just kind of like you know massage your vision around the tools and assets you have whereas where you teach it it's a case of no your vision is the most important thing this is how you manipulate everything else around you to make sure you get to your vision um yeah and like so even today do you still kind of like switch between 2D and 3D depending on whatever task you need to complete? Yeah, all the time. It really depends on the time I have and on the topic and how I, f- how I feel it, you know. Mm. Um, if I feel like doing 3D or 2D for this particular particular task. And even on the personal stuff as well? Same? Yeah, 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 same. Cool. And again, one... Of all these things, obviously, there's a technical element to it as well, like in terms of, um, and I love the way you break down, especially in 2D, because it's easy to neglect that because, again, maybe the focus is more so much on 3D and even the emerging platforms. Um, Just the basics of like, you know, blending modes and, you know, like using tools in the correct way and proper workflows it's it's very refreshing to see that and almost like a refresher even someone who may be seasoned to kind of like okay yeah i've been let's say for example um would you drive you take a driving test if i were to take a test now i'll probably fail the way i drive yeah yeah, yeah. because i've taken so many shortcuts and maybe broken a few laws in the way as well um so it, for me at least from my perspective it felt like oh no i need to go back and kind of like you know sort these things out because i'm neglecting i'm I'm definitely lacking on certain things but um also the way you again you mentioned before like bringing the painting together taking away the the 2d side of things or the the um 3d side of things and making it to a final finished piece um how long do you spend tweaking and making sure that the painting's finished and when do you know it's finished uh, usually when you don't have time anymore to spend okay. on it, <laughs> when, the, when the deadline is here, because you could spend yeah a month on the painting if you really wanted to. There is always things to tweak, but uh, at some point, yeah, well, it's hard to say when, especially for personal work, uh, uh, it's hard to say, okay, now it's over. It's more when I get bored, you know, <laughs> that I, I stop it and I'm like, okay, it's done. <laughs> And for just before we wrap up, for students who are looking to take the course or have signed up and taken the course as we speak, what would you like to say to them and what would you like to see from them? Um, I would really like yeah, to see what uh, uh, to see what they can achieve with the techniques uh, and uh, uh, tweaks with the tips and tricks I give them. See, yeah, what uh what they're going to do with it and for yourself personally speaking what can we expect from you i guess as the year progresses and even the near future as well like what's on the horizon for you uh good questions um i guess yeah just trying new and different projects and uh i'm not planning to do any other course at the moment but i'm still going to do more uh photo packs and Mm -hmm. travel more and um working hopefully on uh, interesting projects cool gail i'm so excited for the course um and like we said it's out yesterday even though recording it a week before um super excited to see people what they're going to do with it and also it's great to chat with you today and just i guess see behind the artist and you know like what makes you tick and yeah man Love your work. Your work's Thank you. inspiring Thank- and it was great chatting with you. Thank you very much. Just something I wanted to add is that um, I, I w- one, one part of the um, course is using Octane, but it's really not mandatory. Uh, everything, all the things that I sh- uh, show and do in Octane can be done also in Blender. Uh, so it shouldn't be uh, an issue for people to have, to have, uh, to use Octane. It's really a, more of a bonus you know to show a different way of uh, rendering uh, uh, images oh yeah good point thank you for adding that because i forgot to mention that it's like 
Um, just to add to that as well is the way you do the rendering process and even the steps you follow again to get the renders and the certain passes that's what I guess I'd recommend people to focus more on because like you said that can be applied to any render engine um, the, the key thing is to get out the renders that you need yeah and yeah Photoshop and then it's more about the process and the workflow than the software you use definitely okay Gail, thank you very much um, it was great chatting with you Thank you. A huge thanks to Gail, and I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Her course Environment Design is available now, and if you're hearing this before April the 11th, then there's still time to grab that early bird discount. Hit the links in this episode's description to check out the course, and to give Gail a follow. Till next time.